All right, folks, welcome back. We're going to do, uh, we're doing three chapters today, and we're starting with, uh, we already did 8.71, we're up to 8.72. Uh, the chapter wherein some stuff happens, one second. Uh, is this the one where she snipes somebody? Yeah, okay. So, Ryoka goes on a trip after meeting some people and uh, talking to... Tyrion, in the last chapter, she decides to go talk to the Archmage of Memory, and her talk goes about as well as you would expect Ryoka's talks to go. And she makes a very logical decision after um, Eldavin declares that he doesn't want to die, because he recognizes that he's a separate being from Teriarch the Dragon, um, and tries to slice his head off. It doesn't go well. I mean, it's Ryoka, so yeah. And that, that, that's the biggest part of the chapter. And we don't even, and we didn't even cover the the secret part where um, there's. This isn't even the thing that makes Tyrion go like shit, because at the end of the chapter, uh, a bomb explodes in her room and nearly kills his son, Tyrion's son Samuel and the princess uh, who was with him. This uh, is a lot of disasters all at once. I fired through a bunch of shit, and I don't, I don't know what's going on. Um, I don't really have a. I I, don't, I got nothing. I got I I was just like all of the, okay. A quick reaction for me, I guess. While you guys think about what to say, please say something. This chapter, when it was originally written, it was it didn't have quite the thing. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this because I think it needs to be discussed and it's a fair discussion to have. And it was noted by um, several people. There is a structural, or was a structural issue with this chapter in the way the event events played out. So everything made logical sense in, in how it happened. Ryoka definitely would react this way. Davin's reactions made perfect sense. The, the way everyone else worked around it, the way the chapter was built up. But there was a, a lack a structurally missing point of view, which is there is no buildup of reasoning, of emotional basis for why Ryoka decides to think about killing Eldavin and eventually attempts to do so. It just happens and we are, have to kind of take it on faith that it, it's logical and that it's different and this can cause a dissonance because Ryoka post volume six and Ryoka pre volume four conflict with each other because we've gotten that kind of development. We've gotten the wo young woman who has grown enough to make more um, deliberate decisions, and we don't get that deliberation in, in this for this decision. And it kind of reverts back w without necessarily meaning to to a Ryoka from an earlier time, like pre-Volume 4, where she was very violent and she tended to react very emotionally to everything. Kind of hard for me, personally, to miss that lack of build-up to this. Now, it, it, Pirate did try to give us something, a, a sort of band-aid effect at the end of the chapter, where there was some explanation for why. And again, clearly they had a well-reasoned build-up for why the, the decision was made. It just, structurally, it was in the wrong place and it felt off. And that's, that weakened the events itself. You, you react really viscerally to this. It's a very strong reaction. Oh my god, she knifed her Eldavin. It was, it was a big thing. And... But that it, it, it's not necessarily the reaction you want. You want a kind of grief-filled, inevitable, I have to do this, there's no choice, and instead you get this shocking, she did that? She did that? Which is not necessarily what you want, because it doesn't feed into how Ryoka's developed. And that's sad, and it's unfortunate, and it's a rare, very rare misstep, because Pirate has usually done a good job of building these kind of larger events up. Okay. Lots of people to talk. Let me go um, with Zombie. 
No, 53. He said he was. He just asked to give him time to not made it so it is a suicide. Now, my response to that is, do you genuinely think it, there wouldn't be another time and another excuse and another excuse and another excuse? He has nigh infinite power. He's a being all of his own. And if he, was a, if he is a simulacrum, then does he have a soul? Does he have an existence? He doesn't have all of his memories. He doesn't have a sense of self outside of being Eldavin and not wanting to die. This is a clone story 100%. And this is a clone who has complete power over the creator to the point where they, they can't die so long as the creator exists. And they control the creator and the power that the creator wields. It's I don't ever see Eldavin giving that up. There'll always be another excuse. Hush says, it's time for Hush's number one argument on Pirate Abba using plot armor. Uh, I.e., how improbable it was that she missed twice and then he fell out of the tent. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure to what you're referring. You want to give a few seconds on that, Hush? Um, well, so first of all, I'll say I do agree. In the instance when um, she was talking to him initially, I do think the slice was... I, I completely see where you could coming from and the surprise that you felt there. Because there wasn't like that kind of internal monologue where she processes what he's saying and then goes to the slice, which we normally do see from post volumes for uh, Ryoka. And secondly, to do with the plot armor, um, when you reread the chapter very carefully, it seems odd the way that she comes into the tent and he's sitting opposite the table and then he somehow ends up behind her. And then he falls out the tent during the ensuing struggle. That's what I mean. It, feel, it feels like a very contrived set of instances that lead to A, her missing twice. Never mind, we had this whole argument in the Patreon spoilers about how that actually happened. And then secondly, how he actually falls out the tent and gets around behind her. Because if, if you read through the chapter, it does seem quite odd that he gets... So she comes into the tent and sits down, and then he ends up behind her. And, and then the whole thing with the... Yeah, I don't know. That's why I thought it was plot armor that he survived. Okay. I mean... I didn't notice because I was too busy with the emotional reaction and trying to make sense of how it all happened. But you, I, I, I don't have an opinion, but I, it might be correct. Asteria says, just want to say I agree with Oshi. Thought that was down to writer fatigue. Just have to get on with plot happenings. Yeah, that's, that's where I came down in the end. Um, it, it made sense why pirate... And, and missteps happen. It's no one's perfect. But, and it was a... It wasn't the BL end all. It just kind of sucked that it happened on such a cool moment of development for Ryoka, uh, which is unfortunate. Now, Menemir says, I was blindsided by that. I feel like Ryoka was thinking with her heart and not her head. She was trying to save Teriarch from Eldavin. I thought this was understandable since she really likes waking people up, like she did with the Battle of Teresa. I would have liked to have more of her thoughts leading up to it, though. But here, the reader is seeing things more like people watching the news. This is true, but I'm making the point that it shouldn't have been in that way. It, it could have been in a different way. We still would have gotten the news read of this chapter, but it would have been established better, which would have led to more stuff. And that's just, that's just down to either writer fatigue or a misstep where they missed a point of view that needed to be put into the chapter because they were trying to save energy for more stuff. It happens. Lord Panther, I was glad that the Queen's bedtime story about the protection in princesses in the Princess's Tiara was set up and is such a cultural touchstone that both Kalanfar and Aelon Domus mention it. Cool. Uh, Mr. Wiggles, you have a comment. So I, I, I just disagree with it being a misstep in general simply because the very beginning of this chapter, we come from last chapter where Ryoka has just visited Tyrion. She's just um, talked to Tyrion about ending the war, how she feels like she can get um, Samuel out of there without Tyrion going forward with his plans. And then we immediately come back to this chapter and we're talking about Ryoka figuring out how her knife works. And it, it, it's a very odd uh, first section. It, it makes you wonder, why 
is Ryoka trying to figure out her knife right now? Why is she going through this instruction manual? Why at this point in time specifically is she doing that? And then right after that scene, we move on into Ryoka uh, going and actually landing in Eldevin's camp. And she sees all this stuff that, you know, she's kind of stunned speechless in completely non Ryoka fashion. You know, we've seen her in the past, like constantly going off on things, but here she was so stunned by what she was seeing that she just wasn't able to express herself a lot. And then we get to the scene where, uh, Eldevin is like explaining everything to her and she's kind of just like, no, 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 this is all wrong. And as soon as Eldevin says that, um, he's not going to immediately go back and become Terriarch. She's made her decision to kill him. And I feel like on a first read through, absolutely that um there's it's there's absolutely a like kind of disconnect where it's like, holy crap, how did this just happen? But when you go back and read that first section again and when you see or going through these knife instructions at that particular point in time, it's like, why is she doing that here? And it's because she was always coming here with the expectation that she might have to kill him. And the way it's structured in the story, it 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 makes you not aware of her attention intentions. And I think that in itself is intentional. It's a surprise to you, but if you go back and look at it. It's a surprise that was coming, that was foreshadowed. And I don't, I don't really agree that more foreshadowing there would have worked better because of how visceral that surprise is because of how she did it and how it was written. So I, I don't really necessarily agree with the... It was a poorly structured chapter, so, sort of say, so to say, but obviously that's, that's your opinion and all that. Yeah, I got to... I didn't think it was poorly structured. I think this particular aspect was should have had an emotional con part to it as well, because we needed we got to the 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 pre preamble for it, the foreshadowing for the knife thing, spot on, chef's kiss. But this is the scene that's missing: is that there had to be hints in the chapters previous to this, not necessarily this chapter in prior chapters that would have established her firm conviction that this is a possibility because clearly if she's tinkering with the knife then she was thinking about this before that and we had no hint to it and pirate could have kept the actual decision away while establishing her grief or fears more readily so that we're ready for the possibility of some kind of significant thing come down and then when you see the knife scene it would be like oh is she gonna no she's not gonna do it what is she what hmm? why but you can't have that moment unless you at least for me and i should preface all i should have prefaced all of this by saying it is definitely my opinion and my opinion alone and others can agree or disagree it's just that's how i saw it it, it could have been a bigger scene for me um Blue Juice agrees. It says, general comment, reread the chapter. She literally began the chapter contemplating homicide and her will unwillingness to kill as a failing. She chose Batman as her name for a reason. Also, she needs to grow up and she knows it. Batman's morals are awful. It reads more cogently in hindsight. Yes. Uh, Kylera, you have something to say? Hi. Um, yeah, I, I think I... I mostly agree. I think it was barely telegraphed only because, you know, everybody knew something was going to go down with Heldov and we didn't know exactly how. And also she acts off like that whole section walking through the camp and all these things. Um, just cause a lot of times she's digging pretty hard for information on people and things like that. And she didn't care. Like she was clearly on some type of mission. Um, the only thing I thought maybe was a little odd is I would have thought she might have gone a step farther since they were private. Like, she took his head off, but she didn't really follow through and make sure he was dead. 
because um, she was more. Be, that was it. I, I think that was the closer. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say I agree with you. It, it that part did feel a little plot armory, but I guess she did throw up afterwards, and she's not a killer. So for her, it was like, it, and it's very well written that it was she cut a person's head off and the body bled in front of her. Not at, for someone who doesn't necessarily experience death in the same way as the cold-hearted Aaron does. Um, th there'd be some get the get me the fuck out of here kind of moment, you know? Yeah, well, Aaron would have taken his head off and poured acid over the rest of him. That's <laughs> what I, yeah, that's exactly what I thought she would do, and it would have worked. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I thought it was telegraphed enough, and I also thought I I agree with what you were saying where. Ryoka doesn't really have a choice because I don't see a scenario where Eldavin will willingly give up his connection to Teriark because even even if he is a completely separate sentient being and we don't entirely know that's true, um, what if he can't sever the connection? Then if he wants to be independent and live, he has to leave it in place. So it, even if he can, you know, get over the fact that he would lose power and all of those issues um he may not be able to be independent in which case he would never sever it willingly ryoka doesn't really have a choice if she wants to save terry art okay uh hat says i'm not sure that's really a good example of plot armor i guess that's in response to hush zombiano 53 says she had made the decision to kill him before the scene with the goal all her interaction with Eldavin was her trying to self-justify herself. She was doing a pitiful token effort in the discussion and gave up a subject as soon as she found a motive to kill him, without even trying to clarify or explore anything. That was This was all over the chapter. Okay. Um, Blue Juice is trying to trick me into saying Haggard voice stuff. Get fuck you. Brent says, regarding plot armor, I assumed that Ryoka went to Paxir, who was on Eldavin's other side. Okay, that, that could definitely have been possible. Um, we have two responses to Wiggles. We're going to do Ren's because it's just a texting. Ren says, on what Mr. Wiggles is saying, there is also the comment about her not, quote unquote, not killing people. Um, can you give us a little bit of uh, context to that, Ren? Uh, I, if Ren can't speak, uh, they'll be typing, so I don't know if she's still here or not. Okay. Uh, just the line that was like appeared um, earlier in the chapter about how she doesn't, like, how she recognized kept, that she didn't kill people as a floor. That's, like, already been covered. But yeah. Uh, so. I, okay. I think that, that line was an indication of her plans. Okay. All right. Huh? Yeah, I have a slightly more unique perspective on what she could have done. So we actually have, you know how he talks about these ghosts that he sees around Wist Wistrum? We actually have Ryoka pausing at that point and realizing what he's talking about, dead gods. And I do have the question in my mind is, if she at this point she realized that he's willing to go out there and slay these ghosts, and that he has at least some basic awareness of them, could you... Um, it seems slightly more implausible that she did not consider at least some superfluous use of him rather than uh, just uh, executing him straight away. And it does raise a question to me as, as to whether or not she, there was an element of perhaps full reasoning on the part of Abba as to what Ryoka would do necessarily after she realizes that he, he can actually be useful even without being Teriark and that killing is necessarily the only way to go through with it. It just strike me as perhaps slightly rushed is is one of the reasons why I could I could partly get behind you there, Oshie. Okay. Uh, Zambiano says yes. I absolutely believe Eldavin would wake Terry. He gave literally no reason to be doubted in his honesty so far. As for his fear to die, he came to fight Eldamus as he knew they have more powerful powerful mage than him because he thought it was the right thing. Why would waking Terry be any different? Ryoko was paranoid. Two bits of context to that. In the chapter when we first see um, Eldavin rushing into 
Aelin Damas, you see him exploring the reason for his weaknesses, his weird beating heart, his uh, fainting, all that shit. He tries to explore it, and he comes to the logical conclusion he's connected to some kind of immortal being, or that he is an immortal being himself. And then when he comes to the terrible realization that Eldavin is not Teriarch, his reaction is to say, I don't want to die. So he, so the chapter essentially establishes the idea that Eldavin is thinking of himself as a simulacrum and as a separate being from El, from Terriar, from the person that he's connected to, whoever that might be. I don't think it's paranoid to doubt his honesty because you can be genuinely say that I'm gonna do good and then still do great evil. You can be a good person and still be bad. You can still give in to your fears. There are, there's a lot there. It's not mutually exclusive. Okay. It's not a crime for him to... Okay, so Zombiano reacted. So it's a crime for him to want to live. I didn't say it was a crime. I said that this is a reality that we have to admit is possible. And if said thing is possible, it makes sense why Ryoka reacts the way she does and acts the way she does. And why Eldavin, in turn feels betrayed, and reacts the way he does. It's, it all makes sense. The chapter does a really good sense of giving motivation to both of their choices and to the reasoning behind them. Mel says, from M. Zion on the stream spoilers, I think it is relevant. Okay, I'm going to read this. Okay, so from the perspective of Eldavin and the world, Aelin Damis is a nasty empire that conquers using horrific methods seemingly without end. They're so bad, they got Wistrom to do something after years of nothing. They kidnapped Israeli hero Ryoka Griffin, as well as the son of one of the five families. Aelin Damas is also run by a ca cable of immortal super beings who are weaved with death curses on them so they don't talk. Ryoka Griffin attempted to kill Eldavin during a peaceful exchange of prisoners. And while distracted, Aelin Damas launched a counterattack that killed people. Then, Aelin Damas released a video showing how much better their country is. During this, the son of Veltress reveals that Ryoka is visited by naked people in her room and weird Viscounts. Then it turns out someone planted a bomb that tried to off her. I legitimately think they could have shown Lucifer and eating babies live on air instead, and people would have a better opinion on Aelin Damas. Good point. Blue Juice says, Inworld has a double tap rule. Hashtag Zombieland. They are literally zombies. Two in the head, make sure it's dead, Ryoka. Okay, let me just move on. Uh, zombie says, there is no reason that Eldavin and Terry are exclusive. By the way, if anyone is interested on my full view on the subject, I read a lot in the comment of the page on the chapter in the main site. Please go visit. Um, I, I, there's... I don't think I can... Describe it in a way that will get across it, but simply put, there is emotional reasoning based on the facts of every uh, uh, that is known versus reader's more contextualized point of view. You cannot compare your contextualized point of view to the one that the characters with their limited perspective would have. That's that's where oh, that's that's my whole thing as far as I'm con concerned. Okay, we answered a lot of the questions for 8.72 in our discussion, uh, but we did cover one thing. Uh, we'll, two, we'll cover, yeah, we'll just have to cover one thing. We don't have enough time for two. Who tried to kill Ryoka? Actually, you know what? Fuck Ryoka. We talked enough about Ryoka. Here's the question we're going to cover. Does Kara's plan survive Ryoka? I mean, literally survive Ryoka. Mel, you asked this question. Why don't you tell us about it? Uh, well, it kind of goes back to our discussion on 8.71 of Kara has a plan. She thinks she has a plan to end the war, to save uh, everybody and live happily ever after. Uh, but then here comes Ryoka. And I don't think I need to say much when I say plan plus Ryoka equals, and I'll leave it for you guys to uh, enter in your explicit uh, phrasing. Uh, I just think we all literally, I'll leave it at that. Here comes Ryoka, here's Kawa's plan, you think it will actually survive? No, 
I, I actually hope so. I'm hoping that whatever her plan is works in conjunction with whatever events Pirate has planned so that there's some kind of a little more peaceful thing. I really need some happy. And there, I don't honestly see any way for any of this to ha be happy. With all the pieces Pirates moved in, there are bits and bobs that could turn this around, and I really hope Pirate doesn't reach for the day of Sex Machina, but we'll see. And going back to the... Oh my god. All right. Hush, go ahead. All right, guys. Best theory ever. It's, it's, it's my Greg Master Assassin. Okay, hear me out. So we know there's going to be a Greg part to this series because in an author's note, before she did the whole birthday thing, she said there would be, would be a Greg part, okay? So there's some basis that Greg's getting some time to shine. And we know Greg's his alter ego and Greg's been getting on with Rebecca in, in, the, side, in the side story, okay? So there's, there's, side, there's like some backstory for the knights letting him into her room uh, for like dubious reason for presence or whatever okay so we have at least some basis here and then greg's just this hot piece of, of alpha meat as well right so he's clearly got all the all the pieces and uh, can we just say as well greg seems like the kind of the kind of guy to take to take some sort of du duplicitous god and just take it at face value right and completely fall for it it's like kasinga could completely come to him and be like okay yeah whatever and offer him whatever. And he, uh, for, from what we've seen so far, I'm conducive to believe that Greg is very gullible, or at least very <laughs> sleazy and susceptible. Yeah. And as a result of this, if Emmerain, for example, had a plan to kill Ryoka for whatever destabilizing reason, or if even any form of God wanted to do it, we can completely see Greg falling, at least from my perspective, f falling for it, just because of A, his duplicity, B, because <laughs> he has a thing for attractive women. And it's just there's so many triggers that he could potentially be used for by the gods, right? And that hence where the whole Greg Master Assassin theory comes from. I need Quill here for crack theories, and we'll I'll leave it on that comment. So Blue just says, I believe Kara's plan hinged around Ryoka, and for that reason, I think she planned to either save her or kill her. No compromise. Kara is literally the only Earther more paranoid than Ryoka, and that's saying something. Also, Ryoka disappeared into a private audience after Kara's plea falls flat in the Court of Masks. Maybe she thinks it's a sign Ryoka is the first Earther traitor, as she had feared. Metamir says, I feel like Queen Oina's plotting was a red herring, since she would be smarter than to do those things that way. It could be the Assassin's Guild rearing their ugly heads again, with Pursui dr Pursua driving that action. She's the main villain in this story, as we discussed last time. Paris clearly acknowledged in the chapter. <laughs> okay, people. Crack Theories is with Quill, not with Oshi. Quill! Zombiano53 says, I think Kara will see Ryoka as an enemy as she should, and Ryoka will try to be... Okay, I... Oh my god, my phone rang for a second. I think Kara will see Ryoka as an enemy as she should, and Ryoka will try to still be her friend and allied, and that will be a mess. Okay, that's, that's the biggest event of this chapter. I mean, it was fairly well focused on those two events. There's lots of little sprinkles here and there, but it's, it's mostly that. Well, uh, that's probably the shortest discussion we've ever done here on TWI Talks ACD. We're moving straight into chapter 8.73, so click the next button and join us in our final discussion of the evening.